Hello you all, if any of you out there are watching, I'm just waiting to try and find out. This is the, oh hi Gethin, thank you so much for being the first person to get on. And Melissa, uh, sad it's the last one, me too. Uh, hi William, Oscar and Matilda, can you guys hear me alright? That, that was a problem last time. Uh, if anyone can uh, whack up that you can hear me, that would be amazing. Uh, hello you all, hi Kate, hi Del, hi Cheryl, Kate, Claire, Anna, Viv, Craig, uh, and good morning to Luke Cameron. Hello Amelia and Didcot, uh, and to Amy Broughton, hi you, of course you can have a shout out, yes, uh, to Oscar in North Shields. We can hear you, says Harry Weir, well then we can continue, can't we? Thank you very much Harry, I really appreciate that. Uh, it's always nice to know that the, the tech is working, particularly when you're utterly useless like I am. Hello you all, so yes, this is going to be... Um, my last live wildlife Q&A on a Wednesday morning for now. Uh, the, the reason for that is that I am starting to get some filming work back and uh, I know that the next couple of Wednesday mornings I'm just not going to be here. So uh, the last thing I'd want to do would be for you guys to be tuning in and for me to be underwater or something. That, that really wouldn't work. Uh, but I, I'm still planning on doing some more things uh, live on YouTube, particularly uh, over the summer. I, I know that lots of you out there are, are looking for, for content. There might even be a bedtime story or two in there. So keep a look out and I'll, I'll do my best to, to keep doing some stuff. Uh, Aaron Meyer says, yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much, uh, Aaron. That is absolutely brilliant. Uh, amazing. Just double check. I've got stuff coming in from YouTube. Let me just double check and make sure that I've got things coming in on Facebook as well before I get properly underway. Uh, yes, we are live on Facebook too. Sensational. Right. Uh, so George, who's in Somerset, says, I'm going to be 10 tomorrow. I'm going to be watching you. Please can I have a birthday shout out. Of course you can, George. Very happy birthday. Uh, hello to Jacob from the Lake District. A happy birthday. He's going to be seven. And hello to his little sister, Layla, who's four. Jacob's question is, how painful is it to be bitten by a bullet ant? And why is it so painful? Um, it's pretty sore. I have to say, uh, I did a ritual with a, a group called the Sotere Maui in Brazil, uh, and we were stung by hundreds and hundreds of bullet uh, ants. And for a little while, there was nothing in my world apart from pain. I didn't know what was going on. Uh, so yeah, it was it was sore. That episode, uh, along with many others, is going to be on my YouTube channel. That is up there already. Beth is desperately sh hoping for a shout out on her birthday. Uh, she's found out her year group are in school for the week of her birthday. Oh no, Beth, that's awful. Hi to Alec Malachi, aged eight. Uh, and there once was a man called Stevie B, who is the best on live TV. Well, thank you very much. That's, that's, a, that's a very nice little poem to start the day with. Benjamin on Twitter, happy 11th birthday for Friday. Uh, Finn O'Hagan from County Antrim is turning six. And... Uh, Ava, who's eight in Liverpool, has been having nightmares about snakes since watching Deadly 60. I'm really sorry, Ava. Uh, Mum says, please can you tell her there's nothing to be afraid of so she can go back to sleeping in her own bed rather than Mum's. Well, well, Ava, aged eight, I promise you have nothing to be scared of uh, from snakes, and particularly not in this country. You know, we only have the three kinds, and uh, you'd be very, very lucky to see one. So no, you have nothing to be worried about. Okay, I have a little... Um, favor that I need you guys to uh, help me out with because for the last couple of weeks we've had a homing pigeon hanging around uh, here on the boat. This is a this is the homing pigeon uh, flying away from my hands. Now this guy is incredibly friendly. He's uh, if anything rather too friendly because he's actually coming into the house and into the boat and um, he's clearly a little bit lost. Either that or he likes the hospitality because we, we feed him quite a lot. But um, I have a ring number from his leg. It is NWHU, which means that he comes from the northwest. He's from, from somewhere near Wigan, we think. Uh, and his number is B1020. Uh, if anyone out there knows people that are into pigeons and can find... Because I've written to all the guys you're supposed to write to and no one's got back to me. But if you know who this poor lost pigeon is... Help him find a home uh, and, yeah, we'll, we'll hopefully find one. That is taking me on to my, my next subject, which is uh, the owner of a skull that looks like this. So this is a British mammal. And it is in the insectivora. It has long, pointy teeth. Well, actually, they're not that long, but it has pointy teeth, which it uses for munching down um, bugs and slugs and snails and beetles and beetle larvae. Can you tell me what this is from? And if we get some correct answers, I may even introduce you to the owner of a skull 
like this. Um, okay, so Margaret Turner sent, says, my son has his 10th birthday today. Can you wish him a happy birthday? Well, I would, Margaret, but you haven't given me his name. So I'll just say a big generic happy birthday to any of you who've got a birthday uh, this week. Tom and Kitty from Dublin want to know, do spiders hibernate and where do butterflies go in the winter? Um, well, some, some butterflies will hibernate. You know, if you in your shed find one in a drawer, it could well be one that is overwintering as an adult. Um, and, and likewise with spiders also, although some of them will just perish come the end of the year when all of their resources run low. Uh, Caroline Bailey, when we've saved enough money, we want to go abroad for a wildlife adventure. Me too. But we can't decide where first, Kenya or Indonesia where would you recommend from Eva 6 and Toby 4 uh, PS thank you for all your wildlife enthusiasm we plan to take over from you when you retire who says I'm retiring I mean I know I'm pretty old but seriously I think I've got a fair few good years left my first love as a nation I, I learned how to speak Indonesian and I, I, I lived there for, for many years um, and it's it's astounding Komodo is still one of my favorite places in the whole world to go looking for wildlife so yeah go there right okay so we've got lots of um, amazing photos have been sent in by you guys and I'm going to start with this one here this has been sent in by Caitlin who's six and saw it on a nature walk this afternoon in a hedgerow by farmland in Northamptonshire. Well, this is a, a, a scorpion fly. The male scorpion flies have a tail, an abdomen, which curls up behind them, very much like a, uh, a scorpion would do. They don't have a sting. It's actually part of their, their sexual organs. So uh, that is a scorpion fly. I think it's probably a female because you can't see that big curved tail, but uh, I can't be 100% sure. Uh, and then we have a, a lovely video came in from... Uh, from Morag, uh, and it's from Harris, who asks, Steely B, what is this insect, please? And, um, well, what this is, is it's actually a, uh, a larva from a, from a moth. You ask, could it be from an elephant hawk moth? Well, um, I think it's a little bit small for that. You know, it's, uh, it's probably two and a half centimeters, and an elephant hawk moth is more like five. Now, wanted to introduce you to this character here who is the owner of the skull uh, that I showed you earlier on. Um, I was going to save it but he's done a runner out of the cage so I'm just going to have to grab him. Give me a second uh, while I do let me see if any of you have come up with the uh, the right answer. Harris Christine Farrell says hedgehog. Yes it is absolutely a hedgehog um, and Elliot and Finley guess a hedgehog. Well yes spot on it, it is a hedgehog skull and um I have a hedgehog to introduce you to right now. Now, I wouldn't normally do this. I wouldn't normally have them out in the open uh, during the daytime. But as many of you know, I work with our local wildlife refuge to rescue and release hedgehogs uh, and other wild animals who've had a bit of a bad start in life. And the reason that I want to bring this one out to show you right now is because I have a message that I really want you all to listen to. Hedgehogs are in big trouble here in this country. They're one of our animals that is suffering most from us as human beings, from the way that we fragmented their habitats and from the way that we use our gardens. And there are things that every single one of us can do to take care of hedgehogs, to give them a better start in life. Number one is to have a wild area of your garden where they can live, where they can make their homes, they can make their hibernacular in the winter and they can make their nests uh, overnight at this time of year. Secondly, now when it's really warm, make sure you put out some water that they can drink, possibly things like cat food as well are really good for them. The next thing is slug and snail pellets. Please, please don't use them. They are absolutely awful for hedgehogs. Hedgehogs are natural pest control. They eat things like slugs and snails. So if you have those poisons out, they will accumulate in the hedgehogs and unfortunately it can lead to their untimely demise. And the last thing is the reason this hedgehog is with me right now, which is that so many of us right now at this time of year are, are gardening. We're going about using our strimmers, cutting back our hedgerows and all too often hedgehogs are in there that's that's how this hedgehog ended up with me thankfully now it is making a really good recovery and as soon as it, it gets a little bit less warm he will be properly released but what we can do is try and keep a portion of our garden where we don't do all of that, that strimming and mowing and you know if you can bear to hold off on doing the the, the most dramatic changes to your garden for a little while longer until the, the last of the nesting birds have managed to fledge, until things like hedgehogs um, are, are 
out and about and out of our gardens and, and check before you strim an area, just check through it and make sure there's nothing lurking inside because, you know, not just hedgehogs, but things like like our, our amphibians and our reptiles are suffering terribly at the hands of our over assertiveness when it comes to gardening. So please, please take it easy, check for wild animals and just think about trying to make your garden the best possible space that it can be for wildlife. So uh, as I said, I work in, in conjunction with a wonderful charity called the, the Save Me Trust uh, with awesome Anne and, uh, and Brian May. Uh, and we will be releasing our hedgehogs. We have four of them right now. As soon as the weather just calms down a little bit right now it's, it's so hot that they would just dehydrate if they were if they were released right now uh, helen barker says komodo is my favorite place too to uh, everyone at westfield year five hello you all um uh, daniel age 12 is the answer a hedgehog yes it absolutely is uh, they saw a kestrel on a walk how fast can they dive in a hunt uh, well we actually uh, i was working with a uh, kestrel just a, a few weeks ago and with a gps tag on it uh, it was diving at as much as 80 miles an hour obviously that's nothing compared to a peregrine but it just doesn't need to be as fast because it's catching its prey on the ground primarily things like voles and uh, and so it ate and mum and down and mum and dad uh, have twice had the treat of seeing hedgehogs ambling around the garden should he be out before dark um, well, you know, this time of year, we have so much daylight. The longest day of the year was just a few days ago that inevitably um, hogs are going to have to come out within daylight hours to, 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 to forage. Um, if they're out right slap bang in the middle of the day and they're moving erratically, and particularly if they've got lots of flies evident around them and they don't look well, perhaps unlike that one there, which has been really well fed now and is starting to, to form into a ball-like shape, if they're much, much thinner and longer and more slender, those are all bad signs and you should think about contacting your local wildlife refuge um okay uh, we have another photo that's come in from frank frank gladden uh, and he says we had this in our kitchen in sale um and what is it well this is so the exact same kind of wasp which is just amazing yes so these are these are parasitic wasps uh, there are several thousand species of these here in the uk nothing to be worried about though it is absolutely not going to sting you it's just a really rather cool thing to see particularly if it's in your kitchen how awesome is that uh our next photo comes in from first chesham cubs hello you all i used to live in chesham well that's not far away from here amazing beach woodlands around there and they spotted not on a beach this this red kite and they say uh do I think it's fully grown or is it a young one? Well, from that photo, although it's quite distant, the plumage looks pretty full and all the right colours for it to be an adult animal. Uh, that position it's holding itself in could potentially be begging, though. Um, so it's possible that this could be a young animal. The, the adults are coming back to provide some supplementary food to. Uh, and that leads on to my next question from Daniel uh, Six and Benjamin in Wokingham. Uh, so they have red kites that have uh, looked ready to fledge. Are they going to come back after they've, they've left the nest? Well, in all probability, they will. If the tree that they're in is is a really good site for them, they could well come back there, perch there, uh, and the adults will come in and feed them. That's exactly what's happening at the, uh, the, the massive poplar tree, which is just uh, about, I can see it from here, it's about 40, 50 metres in that direction. Um, we've got one, another photo that's come in from Henry, aged 10, and Oliver, aged 7, from Epsom. They found this tooth on the beach. Can they tell us which animal it came from? Well, well first of all, I have to say, um, amazing photo, and that is the perfect way of taking a photo if you're going to send it in for identification with something like that alongside it, like that coin, which we all instantly know how big it is. It's, it's the perfect way of figuring out uh, how big something is, getting a sense of scale. I have to say, though, I don't think that's a tooth. Looking at that, that looks to me like uh, the, the the pedipalp, uh, the part of the pedipalp, part of the claw of a, of a crab, possibly something like a common shore crab. It doesn't look like a tooth to me. If it has very fine, super, super fine serrations running down that trailing edge there to the left of the shot, uh, then it's, it's definitely uh, from a crab claw. Charlie Harris age 11, has sent in this photo, and he says, uh, we found these bird feathers in the garden from a small bird. Can you tell us which bird, please? Well, Charlie, it looks like a goldfinch feather to me, I would say. Uh, the, the bright 